Welcome to the University of Michigan Dentistry Podcast Series, promoting oral health care worldwide. A bone graft into an intrabony pocket will be demonstrated for this 45-year-old female patient. She is in good systemic health. Her teeth have been scaled, and she has been maintaining an adequate program of oral hygiene for more than one month, following the last scaling and root planing. The mandibular second molar has a 7-millimeter mesial pocket which extends apically to the adjacent alveolar crest. A preoperative radiograph of this tooth shows a funnel-shaped bony defect at the mesial aspect. The initial incision extends from the second molar to the second bicuspid. It is made along the ridge perpendicular to the alveolar crest. An orban knife is used for this incision. Next, a cravicular incision is made parallel to the mesial surface of the tooth. It extends from the free gingival margin down to the alveolar process. Also, a cravicular incision is made on the lingual surface. This incision separates the cravicular lining and the tooth from the flap, which will be raised later. A thin, V-shaped wedge of tissue is cut from the lingual border of the initial incision in order to allow for some reduction of the gingiva after surgery. This wedge incision is extended to the alveolar process to meet the initial vertical incision. The wedge of tissue is removed, and the buccal flap is thinned by an undermining incision with a barred Parker number 12B blade. Using a Bennett elevator, a buccal mucoperiosteal flap is raised. Then a lingual mucoperiosteal flap is also elevated. The soft tissue remaining on the alveolar crest is removed with Rongier forceps. At the mesial aspect of the molar tooth, all soft tissue is curetted out from the intrabony lesion. Then root planing is done on the mesial surface of the tooth at the area of the defect. Also, the mesial surface of the tooth is planed from the mesial lingual aspect as well. It's very important that this root planing be done thoroughly including the entire exposed root surface. Following irrigation, the deep intrabony defect is readily visualized. The lingual flap is thin with a barred Parker number 12B blade. This will facilitate good flap adaptation over the lesion. The tissue which was cut loose from the inner surface of the lingual flap is removed with Rongier forceps.
The tuberosity region distal to the maxillary second molar has been selected as the donor site to provide bone which will be used to fill the prepared intrabony defect. To gain access, a vertical incision is made. Then mucoperiosteal flaps are elevated to the palatal and to the buccal with a mucoperiosteal elevator. Next, cancellous bone is removed from the tuberosity region with rongier forceps. This bone is soft and cancellous, and it is easily removed. Removal of any bone which supports the tooth is carefully avoided. Bone has been taken from the middle part of the tuberosity only. The buccal and palatal walls of the tuberosity are left intact. Thus, new bone can form into the area of bone removal. The tuberosity incision is closed by sutures. The bone to be used for the graft has been placed on a sterile glass slide. Fragments of this bone are packed into the prepared site at the intrabony defect on the mesial aspect of the mandibular molar tooth. The lesion is overfilled with cancellous bone fragments, which become moistened by the slight oozing of blood into the area. Buccal and lingual flaps will be held together by direct suturing. An atraumatic needle and four aught silk sutures are used. The flaps are adapted with the buccal overlapping the lingual to avoid exposure of the implanted bone. The direct sutures join the flaps together tightly, so they completely cover the site of the bone graft. Also, the flaps are adapted well around the tooth. A periodontal dressing is placed over the area of surgery. One week after surgery, the dressing is removed. This is always accomplished by breaking the material away from the tissues. The sutures are also removed at this time. Next, the teeth are polished with a rubber cup and pumice. Six months after the surgery, the gingival tissues are healthy. In one area, a periodontal probe penetrates about five millimeters into the gingival crevice, while the rest of the sulcus is two to three millimeters deep. There is no bleeding or purulent exudate associated with the probing, and the gingival color is good. The post-operative radiograph made six months after the bony implant shows residual fragments of implanted bone in the area of the prior intrabony defect. This indicates that healing is still taking place. and ointment is then applied over the sutures. Adhesive tinfoil is placed over the graft. Post 
surgical dressing is applied and adapted around the adjacent teeth. Dressing has been used to cover the other sites of surgery, both on the buccal and palatal surfaces. One week post-operatively, the dressing is removed and the teeth are cleaned with a curette. The sutures are also removed. Listening to a presentation from the University of Michigan School of Dentistry, which is dedicated to supporting open learning and open educational resources. This recording is licensed under the Creative Commons. It may be reused and redistributed for nonprofit use. Please attribute materials to the University of Michigan School of Dentistry and redistribute under this same license. For more information on how this and other University of Michigan School of Dentistry recordings may be used, visit www.dent.umich.edu/license.